Hello, fellow risk takers, and welcome to my worst investment ever. Stories of loss to keep you winning. In our community, we know that to win in investing, you must take risk, but to win big, you've got to reduce it. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm on a mission to help 1 million people reduce risk in their lives. And I want to thank you for joining that mission today. Fellow risk takers, this is your worst podcast host, Andrew Stotts from A.E. Stotts Academy. And I'm here with featured guest, Luke Groman. Luke, are you ready to join the mission? I am. <laughs> I've been waiting for this for a long time. So I'm really excited to introduce you to the audience Luke has 25 years of experience in equity research, equity research sales, and as a macro thematic analyst. He is the founder and president of macro thematic research firm, FFTT, which he founded in early 2014 to address and leverage the opportunity he saw by applying what clients and former clients consistently described as his unique ability to connect the dots during a time when he saw an increasing siloing of perspectives occurring on Wall Street and in corporate America. FFTT caters to institutions and sophisticated individuals by aggregating a wide variety of macroeconomic, thematic, and sector trends in an unconventional manner to identify investable, developing economic bottlenecks for his clients. So Luke, take a minute and tell us about the unique value that you are bringing to this wonderful world. <laughs> Well, thanks for having me on, Andrew. It's it's great to be here. What we do, uh, I think one of my clients said it best, that you have a PhD in dot connecting. So I've just always had a, a unique ability to put dots together in a way uh, where you see patterns, recognize bottlenecks, because uh, in my experience, it's always been uh, sectors that either benefit from or are being hurt by uh, a bottleneck as it uh, develops are those that either underperform or outperform. Perfect example of that is uh, in the, in 2005 and six in the United States, it didn't matter if you owned the best home builder, if you own the best home builder, you only lost 80 or 90% of your money instead of 90 or 95% of your money. And so sector themes and, and applying macro and uh, thematic themes to different sectors I've always found to be very important and helpful. And, and so that's that's what we do. We we uh, aggregate a large amount of publicly available data in a unique manner to try to help our clients uh, make money. And for clients that subscribe to your service, what do they get? What's the flow of, of those reports and the research? Sure. So we have an institutional product offering and a mass market product offering. The institutional product offering has a full... Uh, much more in-depth on a single theme report every Tuesday or Wednesday. Uh, and then um, it tends to run anywhere from eight to 12 pages. And then every Friday, both our institutional clients and our mass market clients uh, receive uh, 10 Most Interesting Things, um, which is a, uh, a weekly report that looks at a disparate number of things. And that is really just... Uh, things that grab my attention. And, and then we flush out what grabs my attention about them, how it's making me think about the world, that particular sector, uh, how, how different or similar that is relative to consensus about that particular theme. Uh, and we've gotten great feedback about that, that mm -hmm. product. So mm -hmm. that's, there's, it depends on the, uh, on, on, on the, uh, the client, but it's uh, uh, those are the the deliverables that we offer to our clients. And um, how like when I think about uh, investing and I think about connecting the dots, I mean obviously there's a lot of people in the market who are just you know really playing checkers and they're just looking at the next move as opposed to chess where they're looking at many moves ahead, which I suppose is what you're talking about connecting the dots. Like if this happens this is going to happen. And if that happens, this or that could happen. And if that happens, then this is where you need to be exposed. But let's just remove the mass market out of their, in out of the investing sphere and say, there's a lot of very sophisticated men and women out there investing. How could they miss these things? And, and they miss a lot of things, but how? Well, it, there's a lot of ways to miss important things and, and heaven knows I've missed a lot of important things as well. And it's possible to miss them because you're too focused on 
the second and third derivatives and not just the very next move of the of, of, of checkers. And it's possible to miss them because the opposite, right? Mm -hmm. If you're just focused solely, you know, it's it's like if you if you navigate an airplane by looking at the ground as you go whizzing by, you know, if if you're where I am in Midwestern United States and you head west, you'll be just fine for about 1,000, 1,500 miles looking at the ground, navigating your airplane. And then about 1,500 miles in, you're going to hit a mountain. <laughs> and then you're in trouble. So there's that is the the art relative to the science of of investing. And and when you then layer in human emotions, greed, fear, when you layer in politics, there are certain things. Um, you know, we saw it. I was just watching the rewatching the Big Short the other night with my wife. It was on TV, and you could just see. There's a great quote from uh, uh, Upton Sinclair from the 1930s. It's difficult to get a man to understand something when his salary depends on his not understanding it. And sometimes mm -hmm. that it's as simple as that. Uh, so it's it varies. It depends. But that's um, a lot of times it has to do with some blend of a time mismatch. You should be focused on the long term. You're focused on the short or vice versa. There's political issues um and and there are different incentives there are emotions and and they can all play a role in getting things wrong yeah and in fact that movie the more i watched it the more i got annoyed because i felt like they're 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 totally missing the role of the government i mean it, that was just all terrible bankers when really the fact is that you know the demands on on fannie mae and freddie mac were so you know strong from the politicians from a behind the scenes perspective you know they weren't they knew forcing fannie mae and freddie mac to take on lower quality loans had a cost to it and they didn't go out to the public and say we need to borrow five billion dollars or whatever that number is to be able to finance being going down and providing options and, and opportunities for people's housing instead they went in a you know behind the scenes way of doing it and it was such a masterful political move because in the end the last the last uh, the last act of the 2008 crisis was then to have their committee blame it all on greedy bankers. When, in fact, if there hadn't have been this giant sucking sound at Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac to have to get these low quality loans, there wouldn't have been such a they wouldn't have started such a frenzy. I I'm curious what your thoughts are on that. Yeah, for me, it. it what is it? Charlie Munger says, show me an incentive and I'll show you the outcome. Yep. You know, the entire system from the politicians down to the bankers, down to the home buyers, down to the more, everyone was operating on, on sort of two key principles. Number one, home prices can never fall nationally because they never have, even though that was wrong because uh, they had fallen in the depression. And realistically, mm -hmm the underlying view there is we can't have another oppression. And then the second thing was a, a zeitgeist, a cultural zeitgeist in America uh, from our leaders, from our business leaders, from our political leaders of, of get mine while the getting's good. Mm. And the, there was, there was actually an acronym for it. Uh, YBG, IBG, you'll be gone. I'll be gone. <laughs> do the deal because by the time it blows up, you'll be gone. I'll be gone. We will have collected our bonuses and, you know, or in the case of the politicians, by the time it blows up, it will be on somebody else's watch. And that's just sort of, mm. that's just sort of standard human operating procedure. Unfortunately, that's just human yeah. nature. It's the greed and fear dynamic uh, that you never get away from. And mm. uh, they thought it would be different this time. And, Human nature never changes. Yeah, when I when I started in '93 as a bank analyst, I did ten years covering the Thai banks. So I was covering them in the boom times, and then in 1997 when everything fell apart, and then following that, the recovery and recapitalization. In the peak of our crisis, the non-performing loans were 55 percent of total loans outstanding. No other banking system has ever faced something like that, and we just had a legal system that was, you know. It was like that the it was like the truck that the Beverly Hillbillies rode in to arrive in Beverly Hills. It just cr was crushed under the weight, and they had to reconstruct the whole banking, uh, the whole bankruptcy system. 
But what what's interesting when you compare most countries compared to the U.S. is we don't have a secondary market for mortgages. So any bank that's issuing mortgage loans is going to have those on on their books until those expire. And, you know, you could argue that having a, a, a robust secondary market for mortgage loans is, you know, a valuable thing for an economy. But I would argue that Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac should have been privatized many, many years ago so that they wouldn't be basically subsidized by government affiliation and having very, very low interest rates. And therefore, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac would have had a more reasonable long-term rate. And this is the great thing about Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, and the reason why there's a place for secondary you know, organization is that you know, you do need to, if you want to get these long-term loans, which we don't have, we don't have 30-year mortgages in most countries around the world, but you could get there by having a private sector secondary market where they're funding at, you know, five, six percent, whatever. And, you know, you just have something that's much more realistic. But there's a business there of funding at five or six percent and then bringing on, you know, you've got locked in long term funding and you're bringing on long term uh, assets, meaning long term uh, uh, mortgage uh, bonds. There's nothing wrong with that. It's just when the government is able to manipulate what that secondary market's doing, then you totally distort the system. Yeah, and, and it's one of these things where it's unintended consequences, right? So when you are the U.S. and you start, you run up these deficits, and so you need to finance deficits. And so what do you do, um, particularly in the late 90s, when you have Southeast Asia having their crisis? So all of a sudden, Southeast Asia is no longer... Uh, in a position uh, to finance U.S. deficits. Mm. Uh, in the aftermath of the launch of the euro, Ben Bernanke provide, uh, uh, wrote a paper, gave a speech, highlighted the data. The Europeans, by and large, stopped financing U.S. deficits. So you need to find, you need to do, you either need to slash government spending, which is never popular, uh, for the government at least, or you need to find sort of a new sugar daddy to, you know, foreign sugar daddy to finance you. And that foreign sugar daddy was China. Uh, and so you say, okay, well, if we can't reduce these deficits, then we need to find someone to finance the deficits. Okay, then we need to offshore our industrial base to China and create these trade flows such that they send us stuff and um, we send them dollars and they recycle those dollars back to finance our deficits, which sort of makes sense if you then use those dollars to um, reinvest, retrain, restructure your economy rather than just run up debt. So now by, by sort of deforming this side of the economy out of an unwillingness to right-size government spending, you end up setting up this situation where now, okay, we need, you know, for a, for a little bit, we were able to offset it with a stock bubble. And then that burst. And Paul Krugman famously said, you know, citing Paul McCulley, we need to create a, a housing bubble to offset the lost demand from the stock bubble because we need to keep the demand going to keep buying the stuff from China to keep running the deficits, what they didn't say, to finance the government. So there's this incentive then to sort of, okay, we need to get, how do we get rates below there where they might otherwise be set in a free market, as you noted. Mm -hmm. And how do you do that? You get the government involved and you get them to guarantee loans that otherwise would not have been made. And it all sort of works until it doesn't work. And then when it stops working, you get what we had then. So it's, it's, there's all of these connections that lead up to it. And it seems each, each discrete step along the way, often seems that they get the very least a non-issue and at most a good idea or a, a but that's a you know that it's a symptom of flying the plane by looking at the ground as you go by it's when you're constantly addressing things based on a two-year election cycle based on a um you know what is what is the best short-term trade-off to appease voters you know, you get yourself, and, and it's not a problem unique to the U.S. Mm. Um, it sort of happens around the world. Everyone has their domestic political um, pressures or, or, or constituencies they, they have to pander to. But that's how you get to that spot. Yeah. And if we look at that, let's just summarize what you've just said. Basically, when you said that sugar daddy, basically what, you're, what your point is, is that buyers of U.S. treasuries ultimately is what the end result of that is, whether that's you know, uh, 
OPEC and the Middle East, you know, in Saudi Arabia, as an example, buying U.S. petrodollars using, you know, using the money they're generating from uh, selling oil in dollars to then buy U.S. treasuries and then maybe Europe along the way and then Asia and then China. But it's like we're out. And the reason why it's important that you have buyers of U.S. treasuries is that gives the U.S. government the Treasury Department, the flexibility of, hey, we can spend and we can borrow because there's these guys need these treasuries because we're shipping them so much money for the goods that they're sending us that they got to do something with it. And so now we're in a situation where we're running out of buyers for uh, for U.S. treasuries. And that leaves, OK, can the Americans uh, buy all those treasuries? And think back to World War II when it was financed by many Americans buying war bonds. And so it it can be, and, and that's when you look at the debt to GDP at the time of World War II, there was a huge amount of that was financed domestically, where people took their money out of uh, you know, commercial type of things and lent it to the government. But you know, nobody's got the capacity to do that. And now you have only the end result is. Only the Fed can be the the, la the buyer of last resort. And you now have this incredible amount of crowding out. It seems that's either happening or is gonna going to happen. So where does it go from here? <laughs> it it goes to um it goes to one of two places. And it might go to both places. It, it mm -hmm. probably will go to both places. You know, place number one is a severe deflationary crisis um, featuring a strong dollar, weak emerging market currencies, emerging markets rapidly selling down treasury holdings, FX reserves to try to defend their currencies. Uh, and then it goes to probably a very, uh, on the other side of it, a very inflationary outcome because ultimately the success of the system has bred its own demise of this of this dollar recycling this mercantilist system where the where the the rest of the world sends us stuff and we send them dollars and they recycle it into our capital markets and and in particular our treasury markets it's been very successful and and as a result foreigners have about 7.6 trillion dollars in treasuries so this is a very different setup than 1997 so in 1997 in southeast asia the U.S. net international investment position was, uh, I think, negative 3% of GDP, give or take. Maybe it was negative 6 or 7. But that's important. What that number means is that foreigners own 6 or 7% of U.S. GDP more of U.S. assets than we own of theirs. So it was relatively balanced. In practical terms, what that means is once the crisis hit in Southeast Asia in 1997, they sell down FX reserves. They don't have that many. They, they sell dollar assets to get dollars to defend their currencies. And then when they run out, Thai baht, Indonesian rupee, all of it, it gets devalued overnight. Inflation, rates up, crisis, all is sort of the worst parts of that. The, but that's important from a flow perspective because from the American perspective, the way the cycle has always worked is Fed raises rates, rates go up, American rates go up, American dollar goes up, and it starts to squeeze Southeast Asia in the late mm, night. And once yeah. they run out of dollar assets with which to defend their currencies, they have to devalue, asset prices collapse, economies collapse. And then, so the problem is at the periphery of America, not at America. And then we can come in with dollars and we can buy up assets on the cheap. Fed can lower rates, wash, rinse, repeat, cycle, cycle starts anew. And that was the way it worked through the late 70s, the 80s, into the 90s, even under the early 2000s. 2008 changed everything because the, the problem was at the center. We we, we were the America was the, was the epicenter of the crisis. And now when we fast forward, the success of the system has left the U.S. net international investment position at negative 65 percent of U.S. GDP. So now foreigners own roughly 18 trillion dollars more in dollar assets net than we own of theirs, including 7.6 trillion in treasury bonds. What this means in plain English is unlike in the late 90s, 
when Thailand and Indonesia uh, uh, can sell down only a little bit and then they run out of dollar assets and they have to devalue, selling doesn't stop. Take another 100 billion, take another 100 billion, take another 100 billion. They got 18 trillion to go. And, and the problem is, is at the same time, the US deficit has risen enormously. So we, the treasury needs to finance 2 trillion of its own. Hmm. The Fed is selling another trillion through QT. U.S. banks have been regulated into buying treasuries. They own $4 trillion in mortgage backs and new treasuries. And they're having credit problems because of commercial real estate and rates having gone up. So guess what they're selling to try to raise capital? Treasuries. So you quickly get, and now foreigners have $7.6 trillion they can sell to raise dollars. So for the first, again, similar to 08, but even worse, because the net international investment position is way worse, the U.S. treasury market is going to go dysfunctional. The rates in the treasury market are going to hit levels that bankrupt the United States government before the rest of the world runs out of treasuries to sell. And and how how can the how can the US government, I mean let let's just look at what options. How can the US government use its its might to to very unfairly possibly solve this problem you know one option is they can <laughs> they can go one option is they can say china you're now an enemy and therefore we're not going to pay you back and then they, write they off could. their debt they could do that and that would the challenge is almost all of the solutions to this point are are akin to burning your furniture and your carpet to try to keep warm because in theory, absolutely, they the U.S. theoretically could do that. Just we're writing off that debt. As a practical matter, China would say that's fine. The price on rare earth metals was now up three thousand percent starting tomorrow. Yep. And now DOD, Defense Department of Defense, of the United States goes, oh, we thought we were going to spend eight hundred billion. You know, obviously it's a small part, but their entire supply chain gets. Mm screwed up uh china can go to apple mm. biggest company in america one of the biggest companies in america we're going to you know raise we're going to put a tariff on all apple products before they leave the country mm. we'll just take yeah. it out of apple's p l yeah uh there's a lot of you know we're gonna slow steam the ships we're gonna i mean there's just so and there's Okay, so people so, say, so, well, they can move out of China, they but they they can't move out of China on any time horizon that matters. Yeah, in 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 Asia here, people are all excited about Vietnam absorbing a lot of this stuff in China, but you know, there's a limit to what Vietnam can absorb, and Thailand, <laughs> you know, Thailand struggling to absorb the high tech stuff, very difficult for Thailand. Uh, so let's just say that what you've just described is that China has tremendous leverage now because of the supply chain nature of of what that's integrated into the system. So okay, so the U.S. Uh, it's just rough with China, but they can't put demands on. But let's just say that, you know, the other thing is U.S. has military power to force. And, and also they have FATCA power also. And FATCA power is enormous. You know, when you when for those people that aren't familiar with it, you know, basically, if an Australian woman goes to Hong Kong to start a business and opens a bank account in Hong Kong, she's going to be faced with a U.S. Treasury Department document that she's going to be required to fill out. And I always say to my American friends, imagine if you went to your local bank and you open up a bank account and there was a Chinese document from the Chinese government saying you need to declare X, Y, Z. And maybe it was in Chinese language. <laughs> but the the intrusiveness of FATCA and the ability, I think, with Obama was really uh, one that really kicked off the use of the U.S. government, the U.S., what I call the, the U.S. global financial system to punish Russia and Russian companies and oligarchs and all that stuff. And then that was like an awakening. And now we see that the U.S. government uses and can use that power. And yes, you know, it, it's going to force a new currency block and all that. But, you know, that's not going to be something that's going to be an alternative. Anybody that that's going to be pushed out of the U.S., uh, the global U.S. dollar uh, system, financial system, is going to suffer tremendously. So, are there other things that extreme things that the U.S. government could do? Sure, I mean you that you can do what they did to Russia, right? Just grab the FX reserves. 
Uh, but here too, it's like burning the furniture to stay warm. What was the fallout? Russia's Russia's economy has actually outperformed the American economy <laughs> uh, since then. Number one, number two, that's a weapon that you get to use exactly once. And arguably they used it against Iran in 2012. We essentially hyperinflated Iran's uh, economy by kicking them out of SWIFT, mm. the uh, uh, the international banking system. And, and the problem, once you use that, you know, and that was a little bit like using that against Iran. I mean, and there's, it, I can see there are possibly national security things that are classified that I don't know that it had to be used then. But using that weapon in 2012 against Iran was a little bit like, like, like play, you know, sched being Alabama and scheduling like St. Mary's sister, you know, sisterhood of the blind as a football game. I mean, it just, you didn't need to have Alabama's line come up and sh like, it was just mm. overkill. It was an elephant gun to kill a fly. Mm -hmm. Um, So you can do what Russia did or what we did to Russia, but all that's going to do is notify the rest of the world. The second the next time you disagree with the Americans on something, they're going to take your money. And so guess what it does? It starts hurting the treasury market. And so now when you see the U.S. treasury market has had its worst three-year sell-off in 220 years, this is the worst peak to try. Now, granted, it was from the lowest level in two, right. 300 years, but the U.S. treasury market has never sold off three years in a row. Why? Well, part of the problem is who's going to buy the long end? If you're a foreigner... Because let's look around the world and go through the countries that have at some point been enemies of the United States, Japan, Britain, Canada, Israel. And these are the guys that are our friends now. We have been Germany. enemies with them or tense at some mm. point. The Saudi, all of them. And, you know, I heard people in OPEC after we seized Russia's FX reserves, they found it, quote unquote, horrifying. Mm. We need to start thinking about diversifying our reserves. So what have we seen? We've seen global central banks buying gold at the fastest pace in 70 years. Mm. And they're not buying treasuries. They, global central banks have not bought a treasury on net in nine years, not since 2014. So you can do those things and those things will inflict pain and those things will increase the dollar and inflict economic pain. There's no question about that. However, unlike because of that net international investment position, again, they own 7.6 trillion in treasuries. They own 11 trillion in dollar assets. Mm. And the United States, because we've offshored everything, we are now uniquely sensitive to asset prices. We have to have asset prices rise or else the US economy comes unhinged. Our tax receipts last year were down uh, $500 billion, 10%. With, with no change in employment. Why? It was all asset prices. So when, all when asset you, prices. When, just to understand that clearly, what you're saying is that we don't really have the manufacturing or productive capacity that could earn the way out of of that and 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 produce the tax revenue that's needed. And you know, you, one yeah. of the things you one of the things, I mean, I I went to China and did my PhD there over the last uh, 10 years or so, and I, I finished it in 2016. And I just went as a student and was going back and forth between Thailand and China as I was working also. And you just see the intensity of the engineering focus, the, the infrastructure that they're building out. I mean, it's incredible. And even if you look at the infrastructure that was built out in 2008, you know, and then you look at America, like they spend $10 trillion and then nothing. It was spent on war and it was spent on all of these things. And there is nothing Invested Nothing in at least you could say in 2008 when China, for instance, really went through a a QE type of thing. They had they can say at the end of it, we we just installed 500 you know or 5,000 new kilometers of high speed trains you know between cities. There's nothing. Yeah. In there was nothing. There was no payback of the productivity, and so that's 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 sort of the the elephant in the room the people are waking up to, which is all of these financial weapons that the U S wants to use. It's, it's a little bit like the final scene of, of, of platoon <laughs> where they're getting overrun and they call in the airstrike and it's like, you know, get in your holes and hope for the best. And that net international investment position is so great 
you think about the order of things. When was the last time in your or my lifetimes, in, in our business lifetimes, that we saw a cycle where the UK gilt market blew up before any major emerging market? Mm. Where the US Treasury market went dysfunctional September 22, March 23, October 22. I mean, the United States Treasury market, let's be clear, crashed. People say, well, something's going to crash. Something's gonna... Something already crashed. The long bond in the America fell 20% in two months. Mm. When was the last time we saw that happen before China blew up? Before, you know, yes, the Russian ruble got hit and, and absolutely. But, you know, it went from 70 to 120 to 60 to 100. And now it's back to 90. Like, mm. like that's kind of like a, a normal, that's not that out of the ordinary for, for, for Russia. Um, for America... This net international investment position issue, they have so they they have greater staying power than our treasury market, which makes it very, very tricky to weaponize the financial system. And it is it, literally like, you know, are we willing to cut off our own leg? It's not, well, mm. you know, we will, you know, we'll cut our hand and they'll bleed out. It's now, are we willing to hack off our own leg to try to, you know, use it to beat them? And it's like, well, maybe we should take a different strategy. And the net inter international position that you're talking about is a combination of bonds and you know equity. But equity, I suspect, is this a small portion now. And really, the reason why it's a negative number is just because of so much money of foreigners being invested in U.S. treasuries. Would that be correct in saying that? Yeah, it's it, the way to think about it is is just the the foreign countries' piggy banks. It's the accumulated surpluses that they have run against the United States over 30, 40, 50, sometimes 60 years. Mm -hmm. And yeah, as you look at the 18 trillion, 7.6 trillion are in treasury bonds. There's probably a pretty good slug, I would guess. Another, I don't know, four or five trillion is probably mortgages. Uh, mm -hmm. Maybe it's maybe it's two, three trillion, whatever, some corporates. And then there's a pretty decent slug of equities as well. Uh, and, and some other foreign assets, et cetera. So it's a, it's such a big number. And the United States, number one, that number's gotten so big. Number two, the U.S. has allowed its economy to evolve such that consumer spending, marginal consumer spending, marginal tax receipts are all hypersensitive to asset prices. And then we've allowed our debt to GDP to get so high that we can't afford a recession. The, you, mm. A recession is so you if you can't have a recession without having a debt crisis and you can't have an asset price fall without having a recession and you then who has the power? And, and, and if we know the foreigners won't run out of assets until we have an asset price decline. Then if we go like you can see how this is going to go, we can sort of mm. beat our chests and say America and we're going to weaponize the dollar not going to end well it, you know it, it'll feel really good at the beginning and then it's going to end the way it's ended over the last year where there's why is the treasury market breaking again why is the treasury market trading like dogecoin why is the treasury market trading like a biotech with you know 100 million in revenues and, and no drug like it makes no sense um have you been to bangkok have you been to thailand ever i've not no uh i want you to make some friends here in thailand by answering the next question and that is i'd like to put yourself like for you to put yourself in the shoes of, you know, a person in Thailand that has a reasonable amount of money. They're sitting on a pretty crappy market that hasn't really been that great. It's still, it's got, it's Thailand has, let's say 250 large enough and liquid enough companies, which is bigger than Singapore or Philippines or Indonesia or most other countries around Southeast Asia. So there is an alternative to keep your money in the Thai market. You also have alternatives to invest around the world. And many people have invested in the U S and have ridden the, the wave on the tech, uh, the tech aspect, but now they're, they're asking lots of questions and they have no obligation or need to own anything U S dollar. So on the one hand, they get freaked out and they want to sell dollars. And on the other hand, they see dollar assets rising and it's really confusing and difficult for them. So they don't really know what to do. So let's just take a, let's just look at a, maybe let's look at a one in a five year view. Maybe like on a one year view, should a Thai person or a non US person uh, take their money out of US assets or just ride the, the, the dollar or what should they do in relation to US dollar assets? Well, on a one year time horizon, depending on you know risk tolerance, you know, whatever. But I, 
I would own one year treasuries at 5%. Mm -hmm. Because again, there's two phases of this crisis. The first phase of this crisis is likely to be deflationary with the dollar going up. And then once the treasury market really has an issue, we are going to print more money than we did in 2020. It's going to be a tidal wave, which is going to be great. It's going to be bad for the dollar, but it's going to be great for everything else. It's going to be great for emerging markets. It's going to be great for U.S. equities. And so that's the two phases. So I, I wouldn't say I don't want to own dollar assets at all. I think mm. for one year, I want to own, I, you know, I would I would actually own, um, you know, one year treasuries. I would own large blue cap, blue cap, blue chip, and mm. <laughs> large cap, blue chip, uh, U.S. equities uh, that that pay a decent dividend that have some pricing power um, and good balance sheets. Mm. Uh, I do not want to own long term U.S. treasuries. Uh, I would not own long term U.S. debt, dollar debt. I would stay at the short end because I don't know the timing on all this. Um, and so just to be clear on that, it's because you're afraid that interest rates could balloon and you would get crushed on that long term debt holding. One of two things is going to happen. Interest rates are going to balloon or one of two things are most likely to happen. Let me go. Mm. Either interest rates are going to balloon or interest rates are going to start to balloon and the Fed is going to come in and do more QE to stop them from ballooning anymore because the U.S. government with its debt load cannot afford for them to balloon. Mm. The other alternative is we get a productivity miracle or the United States slashes defense and entitlement spending by roughly 20 to 40 percent immediately and permanently. And you and I both know that that's probably not going to happen. That's not going to happen. And for someone that says, uh, I don't really care about the next year or two, what I care about is I got a huge amount of money and I care about the next five or 10 years for my future generations and all that. And I'm not into trading that. I'm willing to take a position and it could go against me for a while, but I really want to make the big long-term trade. What would that be? Probably put 10 to 20% by 15% gold, 5% Bitcoin. And then I would take the other 80%. And here too, I want to avoid long-term debt. I think long-term debt, mm. it probably is fine nominally, but it, it mathematically is highly likely to lose on a real basis. And so then I want to think about, okay, equities, commodities, and then what does that look like? Uh, some real estate. And then what does that look like as I think about those as more inflation sensitive, harder assets than long-term bonds that will better preserve purchasing power. Uh, where do I want that? And, and I probably, I still want to have dollar assets, but mm. I probably, you know, the U S equity market cap is what, like 60, 65% of global. Mm. I would yeah. probably take the under on that. I'd probably yeah. put 30 or 40 of it in, in, in the U S and then the balance in, you know, probably Southeast Asia, India, uh, maybe a little bit in Europe if they can ever figure out how to get out of their own way. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I would probably spend more in, in sort of industrial type. Um, but that that's how I that's how I would think about the five year uh, yeah. because I I would be shocked if we were sitting here in five years and. I mean, look, the debt crisis, is, it's here. It's accelerating. Yeah. It's yeah. not even something like that is in the future. I would be shocked if it hasn't sort of gotten past the critical point and sort mm. of if, if we're not sort of in the denouement of this whole thing uh, then, by then. It's it's incredible where U.S. is. I mean, I, I can remember back in <clears> about <throat> 1984 when I went to Kent State University after graduating from Hudson nearby. And yep. <clears throat> I remember standing up and fighting people to say government shouldn't have all this debt. This was back in those days. And then as I went to Long Beach State later and I moved to California, I was arguing that we shouldn't put tariffs on Japanese competition, you know, the Japanese automakers, that we should let General Motors go bankrupt. And bankruptcy is a good thing. In the end, you're going to split that company up and it's going to become a much stronger company. Of course, uh, you know, how many times has General Motors gone bankrupt since since 1985? Uh, it's just incredible where America's gone. And it, it, you couldn't even imagine how debt could get out of control. So fascinating. Now it's time to share your worst investment ever. And since no one goes into their worst investment thinking it will be, 
Tell us a bit about the circumstance leading up to it and then tell us your story. I kind of snuck in a lot of time to talk about strategy. So <laughs> let's get into it. So my worst investment ever um, was a private equity investment I made. I think I started investing in it in late 2000 or early 2001. It was relatively early in my career. The U.S. was actually already in recession. Uh, it was a tech facing company that was a, they basically were creating like a, I guess it was almost like an Amazon you know, before Amazon. I mean, Amazon was just like a mm. little book, book seller, right? Uh, but they were selling uh, for building supplies, basically like an Amazon of book supplies, uh, uh, building up a database. And it was really going to be for the, um, uh, more the industrial slash uh, the B2B space, really, yep. I guess is how they used to call it, right? The business mm -hmm. to business space. And a uh, great founder had, had created and sold some tech companies before, was was known was known by some friends of mine. I had a, a, one of my dearest friends in the world went and worked there. So I had somebody who was on the inside, was telling me it was going really well. And I, so I invested and I was really happy with it. it was getting, they were making progress. Uh, and then I made my first mistake, which was I got too big. And I got mm. in terms of, I mean, gosh, it was probably because I was getting, it was my very dear friend. I have an inside read. This guy's done this before. I have mutual friends who knew the other businesses that the guy sold, excitement. Uh, so I bet you at one point it was probably, you know, this is a private equity tech investment, not cash flow positive. I probably had it. 25, 30% of my, mm. of my liquid net worth or my total net worth. I was a pretty young guy then, uh, but it was a lot of money. I was like, oh, I have the time to make it up. Now, the good news was I knew I was young and I knew I would have time to make it up, but I really didn't think anything bad was going to come of it. And then I met the head guy and I realized he was not a very good salesperson. Um, and you never realize how important sales is. Everyone always poo poo sales. I was a sales guy. Like I, it, it was, it was, but being able to sell your idea and as, as a founder in that area was is critical. Mm -hmm. And and he wasn't a great salesperson. So that was kind of like, okay, well, it, it, it's okay. The next issue, what was it? Oh, I had a friend of mine that I then we had a new analyst join us at the firm I was working at. And he was he was a tech guy. Now I was in Cleveland, Midwest. We'd historically done sort of these Rust Belt you know, industrials and retail consumer and, and healthcare, but nothing, you know, things that we were, we knew mm -hmm. never really had much exposure in tech, didn't know tech. So we bring a couple tech guys in and I'm talking about it with this analyst. And he said, well, what's the initial valuation that they, they raised the money at? And I told him what the value, he goes, oh, you're going to lose all your money. Like he knew right <laughs> then. I go, oh no. I said, how can you possibly know that? And this is a guy who'd been in the in Silicon Valley great dude he's great and he goes the, the value is too high you started the value too high you have to start it way lower for it to work out i'm like uh-oh so anyway i'm still hearing from my buddy that hey it's going well it's going well it's going well and actually as it turns out they had a deal done with a major international conglomerate to buy it for like i want to say it was like a five or eight times what I would have made five or eight times on my money. Mm. Right. Yay. And if it was me again, I think this goes back to the sales. It's like when you know, you have a good deal, like you, 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 the, 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 the perfect is the enemy of the good. Right? right. And, and he had a good deal. And I think he was trying to get too cute and maintain certain ownership traits and whatever. And then nine 11 happened. Oh. And after nine 11 happened, funding, recession and it just never so i ended up losing all my money um so i had a tax write off that i took <laughs> courtesy <laughs> city irs <laughs> religiously three thousand bucks a year carry forward carry forward carry forward for a lot of years yeah. you know offsetting gains for a lot of years other gains for a lot of years uh and i learned a lot i learned yet yeah, number one position sizing is so important like, had I not been so big, hey, you know, these things, I mean, you know, private mm -hmm. equity, 
it, it, it comes, it goes. It's, it's a little bit of a lottery ticket, especially in sort of venture capital, not cash flowing tech related stuff. Um, getting too excited and not being sort of removed because I knew, you know, I had a buddy there and he was super excited and things were going well. And um, that was, that was uh, mm -hmm. probably mistake. Number two is getting too emotionally invested. And then I think, you know, it, the other side of it was just, you need, you know, learning. No, you know, I didn't know any better to know, Hey, the valuation was too, too rich from the start. Had I known that I never would have put all that money in. I might've done a little bit smaller, but or I would have done it still, but it would have been a lot smaller. Uh, and then just the importance of sales in, mm. in when you have a founder and you meet the founder in one of these types of things or, or the, 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 the managing partner, they've got to be, they've got to blow your socks off on sort of every aspect or on, 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 you know, numerous aspects, not just the product, but the marketing and the, the sales and feet, you know, they, they are, you know, they got to kind of be like Navy seals in terms of just really good at a lot of different things. And uh, it was, it was a great, it was a great yeah. learning experience. Uh, yeah. My friend and I are yeah. still very dear friends to this day. It, it didn't hurt our relationship at all, which is in the end, all that really matters. But that was, that was my, that was my worst investment. Yeah, I think my my takeaway is, you know, also just the, the the illiquidity aspect of, you know, private equity and private investment. Everybody wants to get in on at the bottom at the ground when this thing's starting, you know, the the Italian restaurant around the corner or the Thai restaurant around the corner. It's going to be amazing, you know. Everybody wants to get in, but the problem about all of that is it's just the liquidity is so, you know, so severe, you know, the illiquidity. When I moved to Thailand in 1992, by 1995, my good friend Dale came from from Hudson also, where we grew up together. And he said, let's start a coffee factory. And we started a coffee business that's now almost 30 years old, let's say, getting close to that. But it was a very illiquid investment. And I basically had to think right from the beginning of really when I started to have money, I was, I was totally torn in my investment style because I had this very illiquid investment. And we were just going into the 1997 crisis. So we needed funding and nobody's going to lend, you know, here's two American guys in, in, in Thailand, you know, who's going to lend them money for a startup <laughs> at that time in particular. So, you know, I had to fund and think about the funding of it and think about the illiquidity of it and think about the going to zero aspect. And then on the other hand, so here I have a huge, the uh, huge risk and it made me also realize that I had to kind of have a barbell strategy where I had a very low risk uh, level. So some people are kind of surprised that I'm not a big risk taker on the stock side. Part of it is because I was, you know, I was kind of stuck in a situation of a private investment that we couldn't really get out of. And, you know, eventually it, it worked out. But the point is, is that that those types of private investments and those types of non, let's say, stock market listed things that have liquidity, you got to think very carefully because it, it can be a trap, you know, where you do get trapped. And we we were trapped for probably the first 10 years until it started to, you know, <laughs> turn. So, <laughs> so based yeah. on what you learned from that, this story and what you continue to learn, let's think about a young person like yourself at that time, an opportunity of a lifetime comes, you know, you don't have a chance to, per, you know, perfectly understand the valuation. You don't have a chance to necessarily meet the, the founder and, you know, you may or you may not, but what, is the advice that you'd recommend for our listeners that would help them avoid this type of loss? Have them, it's position sizing at, yeah. at, you know, cause it's interesting. I had, I, at the same time or shortly thereafter, I invested in a, also an additional private equity deal, much smaller. And it was a boring packaging company. I mean, literally they made cardboard boxes. And then there was some issues and they transitioned to making because uh, they had the machines and this uh, to making housings doors for the 737 by Boeing. And so there was a delay in the payout, but they had very good operators and it took longer than I thought. But ultimately, if you looked at I, I made almost all my money, if you would have taken the total loss of the first and then what the second one did, which was supposed to take five years. And I finally got paid out in 10 years, but 
when you look at the 10 years later, I almost made it all back with the second one. And again, it's the position sizing. If mm -hmm. had I just had I done the same size position for both, I would have zeroed out on this one and I would have tripled my money on this one. And I would have made, you know, a nice, respectable, probably not risk adjusted, but making money is making mm -hmm. money. I probably would have made 15 or 20 percent Kager over that 10 year period. That's it's it's fine. Yeah. That's that's for yeah. private equity, it's not bad. Maybe it was 10 or 15. I've never done the math, but you get yeah. the point is yeah. position sizing is so so critical. Um, so so critical because you can be wrong and there's a margin for error and things happen like 9 11 like you could no one could have predicted i mean it's a true yeah. black swan and, and investment shut down after for a period of time and mm. you're a cash flow burning business and you need funding and a 9 11 happens you know there it is farewell and adieu my to your fair spanish ladies it's over so that's what i would say the number one thing is just if you in, in position sizing start small you can always get bigger um, and you're better off chasing a higher valuation down the road of a more successful operation than starting too big and then having to sort of kick in more money or be stuck. Mm. Uh, that's the key takeaway for me. It's a little bit like, you know, a morning run solves a lot of problems. You know, like it, it just solves generally, it solves problems. Position sizing solves a lot of problems. And so that's a great lesson. Uh, why don't you just tell us a little bit more about the best way for people to engage? I, I, I follow you obviously on Twitter. Um, one of the things I, 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 I'm interested about what I see from you is that you're, you're pretty, you're, you've got a narrow focus. You're not trying to be on every platform and everywhere. You know, I, I appreciate what you're doing there. Uh, first, where's the best place for people to follow you? And second, if people want to uh, engage in your product, buy your product or learn more about it, where's the best place for them to do that? Sure. So the best place to engage with me on on, on the socials or the interwebs is uh, 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 Twitter or X, I guess that now uh, it's at Luke Groman, L-U-K-E-G-R-O-M-E-N, all one word. Uh, and they'll find I have a fairly active feed there. Uh, and if they're interested in learning more about our various research product offerings at FFTT-LLC.com and they can, they can learn more there about that. Great. We'll have links to that in the show notes, ladies and gentlemen. Last question. What's your number one goal for the next 12 months? What is my number one goal for the next 12 months? I, I, I think it's to maintain a healthy balance of helping clients being engaged in markets and then you know spending time with the things that really matter my wife i have three boys uh you know my my fitness and trying to do all those things those are the things i really you know if you look at the sort of a pie chart of how i spend my life it's that's, 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 that's probably at least 80% of it. So, but having a balance there and, and doing all of them well, I would say is, is, is my goal for the next 12 months. Yeah. And for those people that follow your Twitter, occasionally we'll see a, uh, a, a baseball diamond there and a sunset and, you know, you talking about your, your son's, you know, successes. So, you know, the balance of life, is a critical thing. Well, listeners, there you have it. Another story of loss to keep you winning. Remember, I'm on a mission to help 1 million people reduce risk in their lives. As we conclude, Luke, I want to thank you again for joining our mission. And on behalf of Ace Dots Academy, I hereby award you alumni status for turning your worst investment ever into your best teaching moment. Do you have any parting words for the audience? No, I just would like to thank everybody for listening and I appreciate it. And I really enjoyed uh, talking with you about this. It's a, it's a great format. It's uh, I hadn't thought about this and this is 20, 20 some years ago. So it, uh, it was cathartic. It was, it was therapeutic. Amen. And that's a wrap on another great story to help us create, grow and protect our well fellow risk takers. Let's celebrate that today. We added one more person to our mission to help 1 million people reduce risk in their lives. This is your worst podcast host, Andrew Stott saying, I'll see you on the upside.